The thing that has meaning is the struggle to exist. Schopenhauer calls this the will, simply the spirit and people that keeps them moving forward. Surviving is the only goal for the will, and once you die, there isn't any way to know what your life was like. All the singular moments that made up your life will vanish. And the philosophy of Blade Runner goes way beyond this. For thousands of years, people have grappled with the idea that without a higher source of meaning, there are only the struggles of life. In Buddhism, this makes up the first two parts of the Four Noble Truths. Life is suffering, and the path to suffering is what Schopenhauer called the will. Many people spend more time staring at screens than interacting with the real world. Hour upon hour, day after day, it is just eyes and ears that act as inputs and mouths and fingers that act as outputs. We are a population, in the words of the author Matthew Walker, whose minds are elsewhere than our bodies. In this video we are going to explore how excessive use of screen-based technologies, be it televisions, computers, smartphones or social media, disconnects us from our body and pushes us toward a schizophrenic-like manner of experiencing the world. In a state of optimal health, we are firmly rooted in our body, and body and mind are experienced as a unitary phenomenon, not as separate entities. However, the connection between the body and the mind can become disrupted and when it does, we say that one is disembodied. In a state of disembodiment, we do not feel that we are a body, but that we possess a body. Instead of being firmly rooted in our body, we feel alienated from it, and we tend to view the body not as an integral part of our selfhood, but as a thing, or collection of things, that we carry around with us. Screen-based technologies have altered the dominant mode of sensory perception in our society and in ways that promote disembodiment. For these technologies have placed us on a trajectory where sight reigns supreme over all other senses. We have become, in other words, an ocular-centric society, and as Giovanni Stanghelini and Louis Sass explain in their paper, The Bracketing of Presence, no longer are social interactions primarily between men and women in the flesh and blood, as was the case for practically all human history. Now pictures, videos, strings of text and emojis, such are the disembodied forms of representation that define many of our relationships. Buddhism then teaches us that we need to rise above the will altogether. But Nietzsche also spent years on this very same question, and came to a different conclusion. Whilst we can't find meaning outside of ourselves, it doesn't mean that we can't create it. The will, the process of striving towards something, isn't a futile struggle because it has no meaningful end purpose. Instead, a psychologically strong person can change the world around them, creating meaning out of the choices that are laid before them. It takes courage to stand to the abyss of life and create something worth caring about. This is the meaning of life, to create it yourself. The more meaning you can create through your actions, the stronger that you are. And in our modern world, this is even harder than it was before. With people's value systems and the habit of being completely fractured, it gets harder and harder to discover what's actually truly valuable and meaningful in your own life. Because there is no set purpose anymore, it's all twisted for someone else's gain. And as technology progresses, it makes the distractions and replacements all the more enticing. But these are just dead ends, empty of meaning. All of this also leads to crushing loneliness, as people are isolated by their world from the people around them. And the world of Blade Runner is almost a dystopian prediction of the future, where all the faults of today are maximized to the fullest. But even in this barren future, Kay still has the strength to find meaning, as we'll soon find out. At first it seemed like Kay is going to kill Deckard, falling into yet another predetermined role. With Screen-based technologies have also led to a surge in forms of work and pastimes that sever the connection between body and mind. A lot of us spend upwards of 8 hours a day staring at a screen and tapping on a keyboard or mouse, as the rest of our body stays stationary. In our leisure we take part in activities such as playing video games, watching Netflix or sports on TV browsing the internet or scrolling social media feeds, all activities that are mind rich and body poor. In the last few years there has been a further accelerant added to the disembodying trends of modern society, namely, lockdowns and the fear of COVID. Sight is usurping touch. Images are deposing bodies. Virtuality is replacing reality. And now the fear of being contaminated by the COVID virus has further reinforced the tendencies toward decorporealization dematerialization, and a social isolation, at least in terms of body-to-body -body relationships. Instead of working in the presence of others and attending face-to-face -face meetings in the flesh, lockdowns forced many into remote work and a reliance on the disembodied video chat. Some people became so afraid of other people that social events over video became the norm. Children were conditioned to fear playing with friends and even doctor's visits were done remotely. While some have overcome this neurotic fear of other people in the flesh and blood, Others are still petrified and remain working remotely, socializing with images and taking part in pastimes that lack the presence of real people. A severing of the connection between body and mind is disorienting and leads to a myriad of life problems. To understand some of these we can turn to the condition of schizophrenia, which, as Louis Sass and Elizabeth Pienkos write, consists of an extreme disembodiment, a sense of radical separation from one's own being as a physical entity. 
Firstly, disembodiment affects movement. When disconnected from the body, we do not move in the graceful manner that signifies health, but in a jerky and rigid manner. Literal jerkiness of body movement is already found in the prodrome to schizophrenia, i.e. before the illness is manifest, explains Ian McGilchrist. Disembodiment also disrupts the ability to tap into the power of the intuitive self. Intuition is knowledge or wisdom which is not preceded by chains of explicit thought or reasoning. Instead, intuition occurs in flashes of insight, or wells up through physical sensations in the body. For example, we may have a gut feeling or butterflies in our stomach. To access our intuitions we must be firmly connected to the body, and capable of sensing the physical signals that emanate from it, or as Ian McGilchrist explains. Even if intuitions manifest as cognitive, they are embodied, in the sense that they are both informed by, and inform, the motion of our limbs, our breathing and pulse, the emotion of our heart and gut and mind, together with alert perception and intelligent insight, all manifest in interaction with, rather than abstraction from, the world. When disconnected from the body, the ability to act with the intuitive skill of common sense, or what the Italian philosopher Giambattista Vico called judgment without reflection, will falter. For common sense, as McGilchrist explains, is the ultimate embodied skill, and much of the suffering of the schizophrenic arises from their lack of common sense, or as McGilchrist explains, a loss of common sense is perhaps the most invariable accompaniment of schizophrenia. In such patients, a return of common sense, if it can be procured, is a sign of recovery. Lacking common sense, the schizophrenic will turn to overthinking as a replacement. The schizophrenic mind, in other words, runs wild in a state of hyper-awareness, as they consciously process information that for others is dealt with implicitly with the power of intuition and common sense. Or as McGilchrist writes, schizophrenics attempt to compensate for a loss of intuition and common sense, of that vital, pre-reflective grasp of reality, by a sort of pseudo-philosophizing, or hyper-reflection on experience. Kay going out of his way to ambush Deckard's convoy, shooting down the other hover cars and forcing Deckard's car to land. But instead of just killing Deckard, Kay tries to save him. He fights Love in a long and intense battle, with both of them being gravely wounded. But even after getting stabbed multiple times, Kay overpowers Love and pulls Deckard out of the sunken wreck, only narrowly saving him from drowning. For the first time ever, Kay is on some predestined path laid out before him. This time it's real, his purpose is authentic, and his decisions are entirely his own. So when he saves Deckard, Kay creates a meaning for his journey. He fulfills his heroic path, and by this time he has figured out who is really the replicant child. It is the scientist that worked at the memory lab. Her tears were never for Kay, but because she was seeing her own memory. And when Kay brings Deckard to see his daughter, the journey is complete. Essentially, a disease of over-awareness, in which things that should run smoothly at the pre-conscious level are yanked into the focus of awareness, where life comes to a juddering halt. It is not just the schizophrenic who overthinks in response to a lack of common sense. Rather this cognitive style, albeit in a milder form, has spread throughout the population at large. Disconnected from the body many of us rely too little on its intuitive wisdom, and lean too heavily on the power of consciousness. The growing consciousness is a danger, and a disease, wrote Friedrich Nietzsche. These disembodying social trends, fueled by the excessive use of screen-based technologies, are not leading us in a positive direction. If allowed to progress in the direction of a virtual world, or a metaverse, where representations flood all our senses, we may reach the point where the representation becomes more important than the reality behind it. Or to quote the German anthropologist Ludwig Feuerbach, we will become a society who prefers the sign to the thing signified, the copy to the original, representation to reality, appearance to essence. In 1962, when screen-based technologies were still in their infancy, Daniel Burstyn saw such a dystopic society begin to form in embryo, and as he warned, we suffer primarily not from our vices or our weaknesses, but from our illusions. We are haunted, not by reality, but by those images we have put in their place. In a world where the image and representation are more important than the reality of what is signified, man will become increasingly disembodied and so move further down the spectrum of a schizophrenic-like condition. However, unlike the schizophrenic, we live in this disembodied world of our own accord. We choose to take part in the activities that disconnect us from our body, and we choose to do it for hour upon hour, day after day. But we can make different choices. We can increase the amount of time we spend with people in the flesh and blood, take part in pastimes that use more than just eyes, ears and fingertips, and limit how often we stare at screens. And for those who choose more of the real over the virtual, and who use more of the body in interaction with the real world, such a choice will be a step toward a revitalization of life. For as Nietzsche wrote, The body is a great sage, a many with one purpose, a war and a peace, a flock and a shepherd. There is more sense in your body 
then in your best wisdom. All of the struggle and loss and suffering have reunited the child and the father. And it's in this act that Kay finally feels fulfilled. He's discovered the meaning he's always been searching for. And in a bittersweet ending, Kay succumbs to his wounds. But at the end of his life, he finally got to understand what it's like to live for something real. And that's why Blade Runner is such a massive movie. And of course, lots of its details and themes are left up to interpretation. But what is very clear is his ability to give us a window into our modern world. The purpose, the loneliness, the meaning of our place in modern society. Which is why the questions that Blade Runner asks are integral to understanding our place in the world. And as time passes by, the message of the film will only become more and more important. Remember, only you are in charge of your happiness.